Hey Roanoke, thank you for joining me today on If You Noke, You Know. I'm your host, Carol Corbin, and I'm here to bring you all things Roanoke. While our podcast name might be a bit of a tongue twister, it's a play on words for the popular phrase that is pretty Instagrammable, I-Y-K-Y-K. If you know, you know. And Roanoke, you need to know. I'll be taking you behind the scenes and giving you more information about some of the good and interesting things happening around the Star City. Also introducing you to some of the amazing people who are serving our community and how the work that they do impacts both our city and you. If You Know You Know will be more long form than our current Noke News programming. Each show will have three or four guests and uh, we'll let you know what they do for the city. Uh, what they're working on that if you know, you'll know. I'll try to keep things interesting for you and hopefully we'll keep these episodes to under an hour even though you know I can be a little chatty. And I'm excited and honored to bring you more information about the city of Roanoke in a new and different way than we have before. So you're going to hit that subscribe button and follow along with me as we learn more about our city and the people who make it run every day. So here's a quick rundown of how today's episode is going to go. One thing I want to bring you every month is an update from our economic development team. So first up, we're going to be speaking with Mark Nelson, the director of economic development. Then we're going to have city council recap with council member Peter Vollison. Council member Vollison is going to break down high level some of the things that happened this month uh, in council and keeping you informed about what's going on in the city. Our final guest on today's show is Megan Root from the Office of Sustainability. Meg will be bringing the heat on the city's climate action plan, and she's buzzing to tell you more about Bee City Roanoke. Listeners, I would now like to introduce you to Mark Nelson. Mark, welcome to If You Know, You Know. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, I am the Director of Economic Development for the City of Roanoke. I have been with the city since 2011. I've been director since August of, of 2021. What brought you to Roanoke? I originally came in 2011 with uh, the previous city manager, uh, Chris Morrill. I'd worked with him in uh, the city of Savannah, where he was an assistant city manager. And when he became city manager here, he was here for about a year, year and a half. And what really brought me here was the fact that he uh, sold me on the idea of using incentives to really refurbish uh, downtown buildings and other structures in a lot of the neighborhoods. Um, so we used uh, performance agreements, incentives, those kinds of things to be able to entice developers to be able to, to redo those properties. And what about Roanoke? Uh, for you personally, kind of drew you in? You know, uh, my wife is from Winston-Salem. Uh, Winston-Salem and Roanoke are similar in a lot of ways. They even have some of the same street names, Peters Creek, Buena Vista, those kinds of things. Oh, wow. um, but what really drew me about it was when, uh, when I came into interview, my interview was supposed to go 90 minutes and it went three hours. And during that time, my, my wife was driving around and she said, I found something really cool. So she, she drove us to Grandin Village and then when she drove, me over, drove us over to Crystal Spring, it's just these kind of small neighborhoods and the real feel to it. And that really drew us in because it, it just, you can have a larger urban experience and a smaller, er, a smaller town one at the same time. Yeah, I love that about Roanoke, that Metro Mountain feel, absolutely. Just know that um, this podcast can't go on for three hours. We're trying to keep it short. Uh, that's very disappointing. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> no, I could not. talk that's with great. you, but people might stop listening. Yeah. <laughs> um, so let's talk a little bit about economic development. Can you tell me a bit about what your team does for the city? Sure. We've got uh, we've got eight people on staff. We have uh, I'm the director, and then we have uh, a senior economic development specialist named Lisa Soltis. I think everyone knows Lisa. She's the C's all knows all of Roanoke. Uh -huh. She oversees four economic development specialists that are broken up by sector. So we've got one that covers real estate, uh, someone who covers community development, someone who covers marketing and retail, and then someone who covers industrial manufacturing. Um, we have obviously we have an administrative assistant who's fantastic named Melissa Murray, uh, and then we have two other people that I think are unique to a lot of local government departments. Uh, Brandon McGinley runs, he's our financial stability specialist. He runs the Financial Empowerment Center. Yes. And then he also does the Bank On program, which I think is unique in that it offers no cost banking services and financial education to not just members of our community, but the whole region. Oh, wow. um, 
The other interesting thing is we also have an innovation administrator named Brad Betcher who joined us in November from the airport. And what's unique about that is we're embracing the fact that we have so many different assets like Carillion and the Frail and Biomedical Research Institute uh, to the point where we felt like we had to have a dedicated person to handle those things. So we have the traditional legs of the economic development stool, but we're also embracing community development and innovation at the same time. That is really, really cool. Yeah, I was lucky to work with Brad a couple weeks ago, and he is such a um, sort of effervescent guy. Like, he draws you in. You can tell how passionate he is throughout uh, the Innovation Corridor and all of the projects he has going on there. And he's a fascinating guy because he's done – he's lived everywhere. He's done a lot of different things. He has an MBA from the University of Washington. He's worked in startups. Uh, he's worked on. He's worked for uh, for banks. I mean, he's done a little bit of everything, and it shows in his experience. So, the main reason we have you in here today, uh, May is National Small Business Month, and we really want to talk about small businesses in the city of Roanoke. So, what can you tell us about some of the small businesses we have here? You know, uh, there's two things I wanted to talk about. One that I wanted to particularly highlight was uh, if you go, if you're in downtown Roanoke and you go over to the former fire station number one, you'll notice that Texture is the uh, has the first floor of that, uh, and they have a great restaurant in the back called Stop. Uh, texture is um, m- maybe what people think of as a small business. It depends on you know what you're thinking. Wh- whether you're thinking boutique, whether you're thinking large corporation, they sort of f- they sort of fall right in the like at the high end of small business. But they have their you know they manufacture uh, and they build furniture that is primarily used in hospitality and okay. uh, and healthcare settings. But they also have a line of furniture that they sell uh, to retail now. Um, they, uh, they're, they're based here, their plant is here, uh, and they are very much a success story. When you go and walk to that place, you see so many people have been dedicated to their craft, uh, and you can meet the owners and they're, you know, they're fantastic people. Um, one of the things I wanted to highlight, and this kind of is a little bit outside of the purview of what you were talking about in terms of small businesses, but one of the interesting things that we're working on as a department is we're working with uh, the community development block grant folks in the city uh, and the Small Business Development Center on a, on a performance agreement that will be focused on helping micro businesses. Um, it would be the it would be SWAM certified micro businesses that are interested in in the construction trades. Okay. So this would be helping them be able to get up to snuff in terms of permitting and sort of licenses that they need, getting helping them get into the process of being able to apply for bids and things like that. And so one of the fascinating things about that is the funding would come from the federal government and is administered through the CDBG folks. Uh, the Economic Development Department would serve as the the reporting uh, entity for that. And the funds would go out to the Small Business Development Center, and they would actually do the work of helping those businesses get up to snuff. So... um, it, that is really, really cool. Yeah, like, I mean, it's not; it's still it, being worked on, so okay. it's it's one of those it's things. Not there yet, but, but you know, I think it really reaches out into the parts of the community that councils put an emphasis on in terms of you know there are people out there doing business who either are worried that we'll find out that they're not doing th- something properly okay. or that they don't know how to get started in that process. So you know, you've got both ends of the spectrum. You've got texture, which is a very successful kind of larger small business, and then you see the work we're trying to do to reach into the smaller ones. When we're talking about small business, what is an official small business? You know, I'm thinking about, you know, the young couple running a, you know, jam shop, uh, you, you know, but but what is the true definition of what we consider a small business? I think there are various definitions for it, but um, there can be all of those things. You know, I, I think people generally look at, when people think of small business, they think of Main Street type things. They think right. of... Um, you know, they think of coffee shops and you know cleaning companies and things like that, um, and it really does run a wide range of of uses and functions. You know, so there's a lot of things that um, that could be classified as small business, but each one of those is very important to, to us and how we handle them. For our listeners uh, who may not have as much uh, knowledge or expertise in the world of economic development, um, can you explain to us what SWAM means? Yes, it's small women and minority-owned business, and there's a certification process you generally have to go through. One of the interesting things, I think, for us is that there are a lot of obviously small women and minority-owned businesses that are not certified. So part of the challenge for us is how do we go out and reach out to those businesses and help them get the same benefits that a certified business was. You want to reward the certified business for going through the process, but at the same time, there's a lot of other folks who fall into that category who need just as much help that maybe either haven't had the time or the resources to pursue that certification. So it's important to remember that you know those folks as well, not just the folks who've gotten certified. 
So when we come back through the last couple of years uh, throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, we did have American Rescue Plan Act funding. Um, in that funding, we did set aside money that was earmarked by the Star City Strong Resiliency and Recovery Panel uh, for small businesses. And so I really wanna get into uh, what that process looked like uh, for small businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, one of the things that really impressed, I think, all of us is how resilient our small businesses were, not just downtown, but across the city. Uh, you know, you really saw the metal of folks tested during this time. Uh, you know, there's there's always the rainy day fund. There's always the, the, the contingency you, you're planning for, but you hope you don't have to ever have to face. But here it was, and our businesses reacted it, in a fantastic fashion. I, I couldn't be more impressed with the way the way they handled it. Uh, with our ARPA funding, we did have a small business grant available. Um, and I believe with that grant, was it meant for SWAM certified businesses or was it something where priority was given to SWAM certified businesses? Priority was given at the outset to uh, SWAM certified businesses and businesses that fell within certain zip codes within the city. And mm -hmm. what, the way we did that initially was the fact that we, for the first two weeks, we gave preference in analysis of applications. Um, you know, we looked at those first and got them moving quicker. But the, the basis of the whole thing was all of the businesses really needed attention. And so we tried to move it as quickly as we could. So um, after that two week window, then we started looking at everything, you know, applications as they came in. So, uh, and the reason we, we tried to do that is because we felt like, uh, you know, the direct direction came from city management. Look, focus on these first. These are folks that are already in a tough spot as it is. Right. This makes it even tougher. Let's give them a little extra help. And then the process beyond that first two-week window was everything that came in was looked at in the same amount of time. Oh, that's really great to to know looking back on that process because during the ARPA funding, um, help me remember, how do you remember how many small business grants we were able to give? There were actually two sets of funding. There was CARES funding, CARES. which came first, yeah. and then ARPA. Uh, ARPA was the process that recently wrapped up. Um, I think, if I'm remembering, for ARPA, uh, we had 100 applications available, and I think we gave out 73, and we still have a couple that are floating out there. Um, and then for CARES, that was a really interesting process because, you know, we were there on nights and weekends. I mean, you know, the folks from the SBDC were doing we're, we're doing uh, Zoom calls and stairwells. I mean, it was really an all hands on deck kind of thing. Absolutely, and I know that many of our small businesses in the area have um, reached out, you know, trying to give us, you know, the recognition and support for, for what we were able to provide for them in that time. So that was a really nice process to, to see and go through. And, and you know, I was really, um, I, was, I wasn't surprised, but I was um, very, impressed and, and a little bit overcome by how hard the businesses work to stay open and, and the efforts that they they made to be able to keep serving their customers it really was you can't say it was gratifying but it was definitely you, you everybody's metal was definitely tested during that time so if we had to be there on a sunday to process a grant that's the least we could do after people are contributing to your economy mark the last thing that i would want to follow up with you on today uh, as we're talking about small businesses for national small business month is um, if someone in the city is looking to start a small business or is looking to you know bring a small business into roanoke um, what is the process or how can they work with your team uh, throughout that process? That, that's a great question. So um, first of all, they can call us. Uh, my direct line is 853-2717. You know, I have no problems with that. That's This is what I do. Um, we have a team of people who are really great at handling these kinds of things. Now, it's the, the way that they can get help is actually kind of divided. Primarily with the incentives that we have as in our, in our department is it's based around the physical structure. Uh, if your property is located within an enterprise zone, that's a state program that gives that entitles you to certain things um, like for facade grants, water, fire, sewer rebates, things like that. So more about the nitty gritty details of, of licensing and permits and things like that that you need. Generally, we work with the Small Business Development Center to be able to do that. Okay. Um, they are uh, they are a fantastic group of people. Amanda Forster is their director. Uh, we work very closely with them, and there is a confidentiality requirement that they have to follow. So, if you're coming to her with details, uh, you know, you, if you have proprietary information that you really don't want out in the public, they are bound not to share that. So, you can come to them and discuss the things that you're doing with them. Oh, that's great. Uh, and that's something that we're not necessarily bound to, but we can help you with the physical side, help you find space, help you get grants if they're available. So, we handle the physical side. 
the SBDC does a really great job of handling the 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 other side of all that. Well, and it sounds like you've got a great partnership with them that you know They're your really team everywhere. works really well with with them as well. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it was great to have you on today, Mark, and I appreciate it. I hope we get to have you back uh, on I'm future happy to come episodes. Back uh, but also, you know, we're looking forward to getting members of your staff in here as well. We can talk to Brandon about financial empowerment. We oh, can talk to that. Brad about innovation. We right. can start talking about new businesses coming into the city. So I'm really excited to have you guys on the show. Great. Thank you so much for having us. All right, Roanoke. Now I would like to introduce you to Councilmember Peter Vollison. Let's say it right, everyone, Vollison. Peter received his undergraduate degree in urban studies and biology from Brown University, MPS in urban planning and regional planning from Georgetown, and has attended the Sorensen Institute for Political Leadership at UVA. He is a board member for the Roanoke Diversity Center and Local Colors, former president of the Roanoke Diversity Center, and former chair of the Fair Housing Board, and has been a citizen representative on the Roanoke Valley Allegheny Regional Commission. That's a tongue twister. He was elected to Roanoke City Council effective January 1st, 2023. Welcome to the podcast, Council Member Peter Bollison. Good morning and thank you, Carol. <laughs> glad to be here this morning. I am so glad you were able to be here, especially given you just had surgery last week. Yeah. So you are a trooper for being here with us today. And council last night. <laughs> and council last night, absolutely. Well, and council last week, um, there's been a lot of council this month. <laughs> yes, it's, uh, it's budget season, so that means that there's tons of council to be had. There's tons of council <laughs> to be had, absolutely. Um, and in talking about that, uh, so you have been on council since January. What has been um, sort of the most surprising thing about being on council? I would say the most surprising thing is um, is how much folks are, are reach out to you or how many times you hear from citizens. You know, I always thought, you know, you'd hear from the, the frequent flyers, if you will, the folks that come in every time. Sure. But uh, when there are so many issues that people are in tune with that you you think are kind of a small issue of the day and then you get a bunch of emails about it or calls about it and you're like oh wow this is you know it impacts a lot more than you think it does so i guess it's kind of um, your uh, what we're talking about is more impactful to people's lives than even i had recognized before being on the council you anticipated obviously getting you know feedback and, and getting communication from the community but I mean, obviously you can't put a number to it, but it, it's significantly more than you anticipated. It is, it is. And Every especially, <laughs> you know, if we have a, a contentious uh, item, of course okay. it's going to be, we're going to get tons of things. But even on some smaller issues, whether it's like, um, do we want to have um, pet shops in Roanoke? Do we want to be a city that allows people to do handicap parking for an extended amount of time? Small things like that. Um, that you know, I wouldn't have thought of um, become things that we deal with every day and every week when we um, are working on city council issues. Well, and definitely big things like that because I think um, the way council has approached and, and worked with the community and uh, handled handicap parking, I mean, mm -hmm. we're the first in Virginia that are gonna be able to, to offer the type of handicap parking that we are. So I think right. that that is gonna be a really amazing thing once it, it's in play. Yeah, we're very excited about that. And anything we can do to, to be leaders in the state um, is always a great thing. And something that helps out our, uh, our disabled community is really important because um, you know, you look at how hard it is just to get around uh, even your home uh, with a disability. Think about going around the city where we don't have every building that's ADA compliant and it takes extra time. And that's where we took into consideration, you know, this extra time that it takes to get around the city. If we're giving that person the same an hour of parking, they're not really getting an hour out of it because it's taking them longer to get here and there. We kind of talked about what has been most surprising for you. Um, what have you enjoyed most since being on council? I, I hate to say this, but it's the same thing. Okay. Uh, being able to hear from folks. Uh, and you know that was one of the things I enjoyed about campaigning was learning about the different issues going on around the city in different parts of the city. Um, and so you know that's a big part of, of being on council is being able to listen to folks and hear what they're what they're saying and it's been so great to hear from so many folks. I think um, you know before going into council I felt that you know it might be very isolating and that you know people may be afraid to come up and talk to you about something. Not in Roanoke. <laughs> Not a problem. <laughs> uh, folks are always willing to talk to you and, and let you know what's on their mind and I think that's great. 
Um, so it's kind of, I hate to have the same answer for both, but it, I think it was something that I wasn't ready for. Um, but I really enjoy now that I'm in city council. And it's really one of those things that energizes me and keeps me uh, smiling on the dais every week. Well, and even uh, off of the dais, I know for me personally, uh, because I tend to see a lot of members of council um, at events that we're sort of putting on throughout the city, I really appreciate seeing every time I see you, I see Mayor Lee, Vice Mayor Cobb, uh, any of our, of our ladies on council. Anytime I see you guys um, out at events, I mean, the community is talking to you face to face. They're coming up to you. They're, you know, talking about certain issues. They're asking you how you are. Um, I love that sort of, um, you know, small town feel about it because it, it really makes you accessible to people and it really makes people feel like, you know, they can come up to you and, and have those conversations. I think that's really cool to see. That's actually, I, I literally talked to somebody yesterday about this. She had moved from Montgomery County to Roanoke and she said, like, when she lived there, what the community wasn't as responsive, and that she loves the being in Roanoke and being able to come and talk to me or come and talk to a city council person or person with the city government uh, and have that frank uh, dialogue, which she wasn't able to get at her previous locality. When we're talking about council for the month of May, uh, we've already said it, there was a lot of council to be had, and that's because it is budget season. Mm -hmm. So coming in, first, you know, year on the job here with council. What has budget season been like for you? Uh, it's been pretty chaotic um, just because I'm a realtor. Uh, so spring is my busy time anyway. Um, and then of course, budget season is, uh, we vote on it in May. So as we get closer to May, that's when more and more folks uh, want to meet with us, uh, make sure that they're in the budget for next year. <laughs> um, and so that's been really interesting. And, and this is again, the budget is something that we are always working on. We tech, we say that there's uh, three years of budgets that we're always dealing with. The one that's being closed out, the one that we're currently in, and the one that we're coming up on. So we're always working on the budget, and uh, but it's great to have that done. For that to be, we voted on that on May 8th. I think one of the biggest things that I'm proud of in this year's is the um, the pay increases that we have been able to give. Uh, we've seen it over the years. Uh, we've yeah. seen our staff dwindling, going to other areas, uh, other counties, localities mm -hmm. nearby. Um, and you know, if you look at what city council has done in the past, we haven't really done a good job of giving giving um, giving raises every year. Uh, and so we had to make up for that this year. We had a lot to catch up on to make sure that we were getting people up to the market rate. And uh, I'm, we haven't gotten fully there. We have a few more folks that we need to get uh, up to market rate, but we've got the majority of our, our employees there. And I think that's gonna help us provide the best services we can here in the city. Yeah, and that was definitely a very large undertaking that felt like it was on top of, you know, the normal budget process. Um, when we're looking at the budget, um, May 8th was the sort of special council session that we had. Um, also at that session, we did a resolution, um, go dogs, the Roanoke Rail Yard dogs were able to uh, pull through the championship this year. And there was a great picture online with all of council and the trophy uh, and the dogs team, which was great. Um, but when we're kind of talking about the budget, are there specific things um, that you have to approve? Are you approving it as a whole or are you approving it piece by piece? Because when I was kind of looking through the agenda, it almost looked like you were approving it piece by piece. Yeah, so there are different, uh, so we have our general fund budget. That's the one that everybody thinks of as the budget, okay. um, which is how we spend our money as, as a municipality. We also have a budget for our um, HUD housing and urban development. We have a plan for, I think it's four years, and we have to every year um, look at that plan, have public hearings about it, and approve it as well. Um, and then I, there might be one or two other things that we vote on separately, right. but the main budget is the the general general fund. fund. Okay. Uh, you know, like especially um, like we don't vote on what we give to the schools. That's already done as a forty percent of our local taxes go straight to the schools. So we have a lot of things that we don't have to go and do uh, extra votes on. But uh, yeah, it is piecemeal. But the big one is that that general fund. 
looking at all the budget presentations. I think uh, you've probably had a budget presentation at every council session mm -hmm. for the past like eight sessions in a row, oh, yeah. <laughs> going back into March and April and, and through May. Um, every time it just looks like it builds and builds and builds. Um, but when I do think about it, you're right. Like when I think about the budget, I'm just thinking about that general fund, mm -hmm. but there are all these other pieces that, you, you know, council's looking at. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. that's why I, I have to give props to the um, the finance uh, department because there are a lot of moving pieces. There are a lot of projections that they work yes. on. Uh, and, you know, if something like the pandemic happens in the middle of it, it blows up all their work. <laughs> <laughs> Let's, we're going to knock on wood for that, but yeah. that's not happening again. <laughs> Absolutely. Outside of budget season, on a typical month in council, uh, we typically start with some of our resolutions and proclamations. Mm -hmm. Have there been any proclamations this month um, that have been particularly important to you? Uh, I think there were two great ones that we had last night. Um, I don't know. I guess this, one of them would be last month as well. So there's three proclamations recently. Uh, one was, of course, um, for Roanoke Pride. Um, yes. That was one that I sponsored and was very happy to have as a proclamation uh, during our Pride weekend. Last night, we, uh, we had a proclamation declaring uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander Month. Um, and that's uh, the first time that we've had that proclamation here in the city. Uh, I want to thank Vivian Sanchez Jones for making that uh, possible. Um, but it's a way of, of making sure that we are recognizing all the folks that make our community great and make Roanoke such a wonderful place to live. There's another proclamation that we did last night um, that makes June 2nd Gun Violence Awareness Day. And with all the gun violence that we're seeing in Roanoke, uh, we really think that that's important to continue to keep that in the forefront. Um, I actually ask that anybody who can wear orange that day. Um, that shows that you uh, are supporting this cause. and. Um, it's really important to us on city council. We deal with, you know, whenever an incident happens in the city, most people don't know this, but when a gun incident happens, we get an email immediately that lets us know what's going on, um, who's been injured, those types of things. And I, ha I have to tell you, that's one of the worst parts of being on city council is getting those emails. I can imagine. Going back to June 2nd being Gun Violence Awareness Day and wearing orange, um, it would be really great. We'll make sure we have this out on social media. We want to see you in Orange Roanoke. So we're going to put this information out there. And when you wear your orange on Friday, June 2nd, post your pictures on our on our social media. We want to make sure that we see as a community that we're standing behind, you know, all of the people who are trying to, you know, prevent and reduce gun violence in our area. Yeah. And, I, you know, um, Rita Joyce and Fed Up uh, were the group that that got that proclamation done and mm -hmm. they have been doing amazing work throughout the city uh, with folks that have been um, victims of gun violence, uh, their families, and uh, it was just really, it was an awesome part of last night to be, to have everybody standing ovation and it was just really powerful. That, that was very powerful to see um, live streaming through our Facebook, thank you RVTV. <laughs> Um, that was very powerful to see. Um, in speaking of Fed Up, and I'm also thinking about a recent presentation this month from the Roanoke Prevention Alliance, what is it like being on council and, and getting to work with these different groups and, and getting you know sort of the information about what they do and what they're providing to our city? How has that been for you? I, that's been really eye-opening. Um, when I moved back to Roanoke five years ago, you know, I didn't realize how many organizations there were you know I grew up in Roanoke and there were plenty of organizations but I was younger and didn't realize and now that I'm back in the city it's amazing how many different groups there are that are working on uh, issues like this all throughout the city and it's great to be able to have those experts come in and tell us what they're seeing on the ground because we're gonna ultimately make the policy that hopefully changes uh, the dynamic of what's going on whether it's uh, substance yes. abuse whether it's gun violence we're going to be the ones that make those policies. And so that is a really um, important part of our meeting that we get. It's typically on our first meeting of the month. Uh, it's our Monday morning meeting, so your eyes are kind of heavy. But uh, once you get those uh, presentations in front of you, it's really interesting to learn that information. Yeah, it's that's one of my favorite parts of council is seeing those presentations and kind of, you know, learning about the different things that are happening throughout the city. I think that, um, you know, especially for the younger crowd in Roanoke, if you're 
watching a meeting, that's the meeting I would want to be watching. I want to learn, you know, what are people doing in the community for the community? It's also a good way to, to figure out where you can help in the community. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, I don't ever want to hear pe- uh, people say, oh, there's nothing to do in Roanoke. If you believe that, you are just not looking in the right places <laughs> because we're always at events. We're always meeting with groups. There is always something that you can do here in Roanoke to help. And um, speaking of uh, sort of our council meeting specifically, or even just things that you can help with in the city, um, especially for, again, some of our younger community members, what do you think are good ways for them to start getting involved? Um, I think one of the best ways to be involved is on our boards and commissions that the city council appoints. Um, That's how I was a citizen representative for the Roanoke Valley Allegheny Regional Commission. Uh, That's how I got onto the Fair Housing Board, was going through council appointment and, those bodies are really important to what we do as council, um, but it's also a great way for uh, folks to get involved and to have some say in what's going on in their city government. Yeah, absolutely. Um, speaking of boards and commissions, it looks like you are an elected official representative on several boards and commissions throughout yes. the area. Yeah. Um, and so if you are a sort of citizen representative on those boards and commissions, you'll also be sort of working with members of council. You'll Absolutely. be working with board members that are, you know, in some of these organizations throughout the community that are making changes and difference. It's a way to kind of get your foot in the door. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And that was one of the, my favorite things with the RV arc is that, um, you know, I was one of the citizen representatives. Rona gets two of them. And Um, we're one of the bigger localities so not everybody gets citizen representatives but you're sitting around the table with the leaders and we're discussing the future of this region together and that's a really cool thing to be a part of Uh, so just imagine all it takes is filling out a simple online uh, application and talking to city council and you can be a part of that absolutely and that is www.roanokeva.gov So we definitely don't want to take up too much more of your time today. Um, Is there anything you want to leave our listeners with uh, looking forward? Keep your eyes open because we have a lot of things that we're working on in city council right now that, uh, you know, the budget takes up a lot of oxygen, that now those issues that um, we've been wanting to work on, whether that's affordable housing, again, gun violence, uh, economic development, we're going to be having stuff coming down the line. And we want to hear from you. We want to hear from the citizens if these are the things that – if the policies that we're going to put forward are going to help you. So be in, uh, try to be as aware as possible um, about what's going on in the council, and we'll try to communicate as much as we can. But I think there's some great things coming down the pike uh, in council meetings that are going to be coming up that are going to really help the city move forward and, and continue to grow. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Meg, welcome to If You Know, You Know. Glad to have you on the show today. Meg is our sustainability program assistant for the city of Roanoke and our office of sustainability. Welcome, Meg, can you please tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Definitely, thanks so much for having me on. Um, So again, my name's Meg. I've been with the city for about two years now. And I, what I do day to day is I help create and implement our sustainability programs. I manage our public communications and I do community education and outreach. Okay, and when you start talking about our, you're talking about the department or the office of sustainability, right? Exactly, yep. And so can you tell our listeners a little bit about sustainability and what that department or that office does for the city? Definitely. So I think it'd be most helpful to break it down to the root word of what it means to be sustainable. So when you think about something like having a diet that's sustainable, what does that mean? That means that you can hold the diet now and keep it going in the future. So in the context of sustainability with the city, that just means meeting our own needs now without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their needs. So when you think about the basic human needs, food, water, air, and shelter, sustainability is really tied into all of these. If we don't have sustainable food systems or healthy farming practices, we can lose our ability to provide fresh food. If we pollute or use up our water sources, we can lose access to fresh water. And if we fill the air with too many greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide, we can actually change our climate, which is what's happening right now. And it's throwing off all of our natural systems that provide the basic needs to us in the first place. But sustainability isn't just about the environment. It's also about equity and social justice and making sure that the most vulnerable people who are the least responsible for depleting our resources don't feel the worst impacts of climate change and making sure that everyone has equal access to our resources. Okay, so we are looking at 
the actual act of being sustainable, but we're also looking at sustainability through the lens of equity and social justice. Um, could you give us some examples of how uh, sustainability is a social justice issue? Can you break that down for our listeners? Definitely. So there's a lot of studies that we've been doing recently. Let's give an example of the urban heat island effect. The hottest areas of our city are the areas with the lowest income, previously redlined districts, areas that don't have trees, that have poor housing. And these are all intersecting with um, people that are disadvantaged and are not responsible for the main actions of climate change. So that's really why we want to make sure that those people aren't the most harmed by these extreme weather events and these things that are going to come as climate change gets worse. Absolutely. And 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 talking about the urban heat island effect, um, what is the city doing uh, in regards to that heat island effect? Definitely. So we're actually working on this really exciting grant um, through the National Science Foundation with Virginia Tech and multiple city departments um, where we're educating youth on urban heat islands and helping them to understand what can be done to help this problem, including planting more trees, incorporating shade structures in the parks, and really just teaching them why they should care and that it's not just an issue of being too hot, it's a health issue. There are so many health problems tied into extreme heat and really just pushing out that message. And we're even incorporating art into this as well. And they're going to be doing some type of community art program program to teach people about extreme heat in a more creative and collaborative way. That is a really creative and collaborative process uh, to learn about heat through art. Art is very transformative throughout the city. I can't wait to see what happens when we look at the the issue and the, the problem of the urban heat island effect through the lens of art. Your job sounds really amazing. How do you like your job? What's the What's the best part of your job? Definitely. I've always said that if I can help people and the planet, I am a happy girl. So that really is the main focus of my job. How can we best help our environment to suit our people and to make people's lives better? And so we can keep these resources so our children and grandchildren can have happy lives, but also so that we in the present can have a happy, sustainable life and not be dealing with these extreme weather events, um, flooding, tornadoes, extreme heat, things that are preventable if we take action now. So that's why I really enjoy my job. It's not just helping the environment, but the people in it as well. It's not just about being sustainable, even though that is the goal, but also um, actions of sustainability can also improve your energy efficiency and can improve uh, your quality of life currently. Definitely. And so I think some of those things might be highlighted in the Climate Action Plan. Can you talk to us a little bit about the Climate Action Plan? Definitely. So the previous plan that we had went from 2015 to 2020, and we were able to accomplish a lot of the goals in that plan. But we were supposed to start writing that new plan right when that one expired, but COVID. Um, so we just bah, finished up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> But we uh, just finished the draft of the new plan. So that one will go from 2023 through the next 10 years. Um, but it's really meant to be a living document and grow, as change, grow and change as we do um, as we implement more of these steps and find new solutions over the next couple years. Um, and it's also not meant to be a plan that we keep on the shelf. It's really meant for the community and to be used by the community. Um, and we wrote it in plain language so that the community could understand it and be involved in it as well. First, I just want to touch on why we focus on the two degrees warming, because that's kind of a theme throughout our plan that I think is so important. Okay. Um, two degrees is the threshold of climate change that we can reach before things start to get dangerous. And while two degrees doesn't seem like a big change, when you get sick and your body rises just a couple degrees in temperature, your body shuts down and isn't able to function normally. So that's kind of how Earth systems are as well. Um, they are shutting down and not able to provide those natural support systems that allow humanity to thrive. So we've built this plan around some goals to keep us under the two degrees of warming. So we want to reduce municipal emissions by 50% by 2030, reduce community emissions by 50% by 2032, and I'll explain why in a second, mm -hmm. uh, become net zero by 2050, and adapt heat resiliency and alternative transportation methods. So those are some of the big key goals in the plan. So we want to challenge residents and business owners to think about their emissions related to their home and business, their transportation, and what lifestyle changes they can make. 
to reduce their emissions and to help us achieve these goals. The good news is there are a ton of federal funding opportunities out there right now, and we tried to lay that out really clearly in the plan. So, so do you mean federal funding is like opportunities that a community, a, a resident could actually get, not something that the city would be going for? Yes, exactly. Oh, wow. Okay. Tell people about getting federal funding opportunities. Totally. So that's really the part that I'm most excited about in yeah. the plan. Um, so it's the Inflation Reduction Act funding that gives $369 billion towards fighting climate change, which is the biggest investment that our country's ever made towards Billion climate change. B. Yeah, yes, wow. <laughs> it's amazing. And so as a result, um, residents and business owners can access credits and rebates for buying goods and services that reduce their emissions. For example, homeowners can get 30% back on clean energy systems for their home, like going solar, and they can also get home renovation projects covered at 30% for things like heat pumps, which contrary to the name, also cools your home as well. <laughs> good, to know, good to know. Yeah, and they are extremely efficient. Also, for electric vehicles, you can get a credit of $7,500 for new EVs, and this can be directly applied to the purchase starting in 2024. There are also direct rebate programs that can help electrify your home and increase your energy efficiency. And we're still kind of waiting on the final guidance on those rebates to put out. We're thinking that next year those will be finalized. But from the current numbers on the income guidelines, we estimate that 55% of Roanoke residents will be eligible for 100% cost of that to be covered for the equipment and installation of those certain um, energy efficiency and electrification measures right in your home. Oh, wow. So this is a huge opportunity okay. to help decarbonize our homes, businesses, also access that money at the city as well, um, and really just start to plan for what we're going to do over these next couple of years to get us to our goals. So our climate action plan kind of is going to have a roadmap both for your average resident and your your person with a, a home, uh, as well as your, you know, commercialize your businesses throughout the city. Um, and potentially, you know, even our region, even though this plan is for Roanoke City, I mean, obviously any of our neighboring localities who see it, I mean, this is great information for, for everyone. Totally. We were hoping that it would be that way because a lot of the neighboring towns actually don't have a sustainability department. So we were kind of hoping that our plan could be used as a roadmap for other localities as well. So as we're going forward through the climate action plan uh, we obviously have chapter six which is dedicated to buildings but there's also information in the plan for transportation and waste um, what other things in this plan are, are good for our residents definitely so actually I was gonna point out those two chapters are <laughs> gonna be huge for residents and for businesses they both have things that you can do at home for um, transportation, such as electrifying your vehicle, helping to make biking more accessible, and enhancing public transport. And for um, waste, it gives ways for businesses and residences to reduce their waste in their homes, um, such as reducing their plastic pollution, which, as we know, is a huge problem. So we give some really actionable tips for that as well. This document sounds very comprehensive. Where can people find this information? Definitely. So we just put it on the city's website. So um, you can find it at RoanokeVA.gov. You unfortunately have to do a slash 873 and then sustainability in Roanoke. And that'll get you right to the page where you can find the whole plan and then broken down by chapters. And there's also a survey that you can do on the plan to give your input. And we would love for everyone to fill that out. Um, the survey is going to be open until the end of May. And we're also right now scheduling community meetings to talk about the plan and get community input. Um, so we're hoping to go to some neighborhood organization meetings, hold some meeting at libraries. So um, be on the lookout for more updates about that as well and we'll be sending out those dates and times on our Facebook page which is Roanoke Clean and Green. That was a lot of information we have going on right now with uh, climate action from our Office of Sustainability. Um, let's uh, take it back just a little bit. I don't know our listeners at home can't see but I'm wearing my I Love Bees pin that I just got <laughs> from our recent Bee City Roanoke kickoff event. Uh, Meg your office was also very instrumental in Roanoke becoming a Bee City. Yes, we're so excited about that. 
the Bee City USA program was launched in 2012 with the goal of promoting healthy, sustainable habitats for bees and other pollinators, which are responsible for the reproduction of nearly 90% of the world's flowering plant species and one in every three bites of food we eat. So they are extremely important. <laughs> one in every three bites. Yeah. I'm trying to think about how many bites I take in a day. I know, I thought about that too. <laughs> but we can just think about a third of our food <laughs> bees are responsible for. Like basically one meal a day impactful statement the one in three bites but i think about also um my pocketbook and so if we no longer have these pollinators to produce this food that we're eating so much um at that point now the cost of food is going to go up because there's going to be less of it if we don't have sort of this free resource of the pollinators roanoke's goal um in joining bee city usa is to promote protect and provide support for these pollinators and this is done through a couple different ways so you can increase native plants and nest sites reduce the use of pesticides and provide education and encourage community participation so those are our main goals. So we've designated a local committee to maintain this work, and we'll start incorporating this work into our city plans. And we've developed a native plant guide that's available on our website too for people to go look at and see what they can plant spring, summer, fall to keep their native plants in their yard for these pollinators. Which is really great from the perspective of City of Roanoke, but also I wanna shout out our local garden clubs. I know we were working with the Roanoke Valley Garden Club and the Mill Mountain uh, Garden Club. And maybe you wanna reach out to these garden clubs about your native of plants as well I'm sure they would be happy to kind of let you know these are the things that you can plant you know around your own home that can help sustain some of these pollinators I'll, I'll tell you aside I have a problem with carpenter bees yeah. they're a bee that I'm not a fan of no. and I don't think I can say that anymore now that we're a bee city <laughs> so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna have to start loving the carpenter bees but yeah if there's a way I can get them to move to the edge of my yard and away from my deck Maybe I need to make them a nice bee house. Yeah, it's worth a try. <laughs> it's worth a try. It's worth a try. No, but that's a great idea to put those bee houses near your garden and kind of direct the bees uh, towards the, the site that you're looking for them to pollinate. That's amazing. Right now, the Office of Sustainability uh, is working with that climate action plan. It's working with Bee City, but also something really unique and specific to your position is you're also kind of working with Healthy Homes Roanoke. Yes, Healthy Homes Roanoke is such an amazing program. So it's a public-private partnership that works to improve the health, safety, and comfort of our most vulnerable citizens through holistic home assessments that address things like energy burden, indoor air quality, and home safety. And the real reason behind this work is the fact that your home impacts your health. So a leak in your roof can cause water damage, which can cause mold, which can trigger asthma. And old paint chips can be ingested by a child and cause lead poisoning. And if your home isn't weatherized properly, it doesn't matter how much heat you're pumping in if it's just escaping through the cracks in the doors and the windows. As my mother used to say, shut the door, we're not heating the outside. <laughs> yes. Yep. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so not to mention that we have the some of the oldest housing stock in Virginia. So over 80% of our housing stock was built pre-1978, which is the year that they outlawed lead-based paint. So we have a ton of just, you know, older homes that have their typical problems, but are also covered in lead paint, which is a huge hazard as well. Yes. Um, and housing quality and housing affordability are often at odds. So families are forced to live in unhealthy housing conditions because there's no affordable alternative. So to address these issues in the most effective way, a partnership was formed between the city and local organizations called Healthy Homes Roanoke. And this group found that multiple partners were doing work in the same household, but just at separate times. And they realized that using a collaborative approach to combine their resources and information would be the most effective way and holistic way, really, to address home health. That's, no, I really love that. Again, we're working smarter, not harder. If we're all in the same place, let's figure out a way to do this in a way that makes sense, both for the person we're helping and for all the community partners. Absolutely. Definitely. I'm so glad that you mentioned for the person that we're helping too, because that is such a key part. When we go in and do this work in the home, the, the family sometimes has to leave the house for a week or two. So if they're getting work done by multiple organizations and then they're having weeks at a time where they have to be out of their home, yes. that's so inconvenient for them and such a you know waste of resources to have so many hotel stays and you know time for their family and nuisance so it is so important to be able to get in only have them leave their home once and get all of the work that they need done absolutely and so for you specifically um are you bringing sort of a sustainability approach to healthy homes is that is that sort of your expertise and niche in there 
Definitely. So one of the key parts of this program is weatherizing homes because homes use a great deal of energy. So we want to reduce energy burden for people and also reduce the emissions from energy use. So it's really a win-win. Like I mentioned earlier, you know, saving people money on their energy bills while also reducing energy used and emissions. Um, So that is a huge part of where I come into the program to help with that knowledge, help people implement energy efficiency measures in their home as well. And yeah, really just making the home more sustainable as a whole for the family living there and connecting them with all the resources they need. Sounds like such a great program and something that I think that the community is going to learn more about coming up. Um, June is Healthy Homes Month, National Healthy Homes Month. Yes. So everybody please be on the lookout for more information coming soon. To find more information on Healthy Homes and how to access their services and see if you're eligible, um, we do have an email you can reach out to that's healthyhomes at roanokeva.gov or you can reach out to some of our home rehab organization partners um, such as TAP, Renovation Alliance, Let's Safe Roanoke, and Blue Ridge Independent Living Center. And Healthy Homes Month is next month as Carol mentioned and that's also going to be the launch of our new website for the program. So it's going to be a completely comprehensive website that has all of our partners, information about what we do, and how to apply. So that'll be launching June 1st. So be on the lookout for that as well, healthyhomesroanoke.org. More to come. Thank you so much for joining us today, Meg. Thank you so much for having me. This has been so fun. Thanks. Roanoke, thank you for tuning in to If You Know, You Know. I hope you enjoyed learning more about our city and the people who are behind the scenes. Make sure you hit that subscribe button and follow along with us each month. Because remember, if you know, you know.